Hello, good evening, friends. Um, I'm Shayna, here to do your evening story. Um, hope you enjoy it. Tonight I am reading from Red, White, and Royal Blue by, um, sorry, by Casey McKiston. Um, it's a delightful book, a romance novel, which is, oops. A romance novel that is about um, a the son of the president and a British prince falling in love. Um, very delightful. Um, yeah, it. I one of the reasons I like it so much is that um, it takes place in a much better world. Actually, catches up with the present, and there's a female president and no plague and it's a very nice escape um so yeah red white and royal blue by casey mckiston oh and also it is a steamy romance novel if you choose to continue reading it especially if you choose to do an audiobook um listening in public could be uncomfortable i know from experience anyway chapter one there we go chapter one on the white house roof tucked into a little corner of the promenade, there's a bit of loose paneling right at the edge of the solarium. If you tap it just right, you can peel it back enough to find a message etched underneath, with the tip of a key or maybe a stolen West Wing letter opener. In the secret history of first families, an insular gossip mill sworn to absolute discretion about most things on pain of death, there's no definite answer for who wrote it. The one thing people seem certain of is that only a presidential son or daughter would have been daring enough to deface the White House. Some swear it was Jack Ford, with his Hendrix re records and his split-level rooms attached to the roof for late-night smoke breaks. Others say it was a young Lucy Johnson, thick ribbons in her fa hair. But it doesn't matter. The writing stays, a pri private mantra for those resourceful enough to find it. Alex discovered it in his first week of living there. He's never told anyone how. It says, rule number one, don't get caught. The east and west bedrooms on the second floor are generally reserved for the first family. They were first designated as one giant state bedroom for visits from the Marquis de Lafayette in the Monroe administration, but eventually they were split. Alex has the east across from the treaty room and June uses the west next to the elevator. Growing up in Texas, their rooms were arranged in the same configuration on each other side of the hallway. Back then, you could tell June's ambition of the month by what covered the walls. At 12, it was watercolor paintings. At 15, a lunar calendar and charts of crystals. At 16, clippings from the Atlantic, a UT Austin pennant, Gloria Steinem, Zora Neale Hurston, and excerpts from the papers of Dolores Huerta. His own room was forever the same, just steadily more stuffed with lacrosse trophies and piles of AP coursework. It's all gathering dust in the house they still keep back home. On a chain around his neck, always hidden from view, he's worn the key to that house since the day he left for DC. Now straight across the hall, June's room is all bright white and soft pink and minty green, photographed by Vogue and famously inspired by old 60s interior design periodicals she found in one of the White House sitting rooms. His own room was once Caroline Kennedy's nursery, and later, warranting some sage burning from June, Nancy Regan's office. He's left up the nature field illustrations in a neat symmetrical grid above the sofa, but fit painted over Sasha Obama's pink walls with a deep blue. Typically, the children of the president, at least for the past few decades, haven't lived in that residence beyond 18. But Alex started at Georgetown the January his mom was sworn in, and logistically it made sense not to split their security or costs to whatever one-bedroom apartment he'd be living on. June came that fall, fresh out of UT. She's never said it, but Alex knows she moved in to keep an eye on him. She knows better than anyone else how much he gets off on being this close to the action, and she's bodily yanked him out of the West Wing on more than one occasion. Behind his bedroom door, he can sit and put Hall and, and Oates on the record player in the corner, and no one hears him humming along like his dad to Rich Girl. He can wear the reading glasses he always insists he doesn't need. He can make as many meticulous study guides with color-coded sticky notes as he wants. He's not going to be the youngest election co elected congressman in modern history without earning it, 
But nobody needs to know how hard he's kicking underwater. His sex symbol status would plummet. Hey, says a voice at the door, and he looks up from his laptop to see June edging into his room. Two iPhones and a stack of magazines tucked under one arm, and a plate in her hand. She closes the door behind her with a f her foot. What'd you steal today? Alex asks, pushing the pile of papers on his bed out of her way. A sort of donuts, June says as she climbs up. She's wearing a pencil skirt and with a point with pointy pink flats, and he can already see next week's pa fashion columns. A picture of her outfit today, a lead-in for some sponsor, a spawn con about flats for the professional gal on the go. He wonders what she's been up to all day. She mentioned a column for WAPO, or was it for a photo shoot on her blog? Or both. He can never keep up. She's dumped her stack of magazines on the bedspread and is already busying herself with them. Doing your part to keep the great American indus gossip industry alive? That's what my journalism degree is for, June says. Anything good this week? Alex asks, reaching for a donut. Let's see, June says. In touch, it's, it says I'm dating a French model? Are you? I wish. She flips a few pages. Oh, they're saying you got your asshole bleached. That one is true, Alex says, through a mouthful of chocolate with sprinkles. Thought so, June says, without looking up. After riffling through most of the magazine, she shuffles it to the bottom of the stack and moves on to people. She flips through it absently. People only ever write what their publicists tell it to write. So, boring. Not much to us this week. Oh, I'm a pro crossword puzzle clue. Following their tabloid coverage is something of an idle hobby of hers, one that in turn am amuses and annoys their mother, and Alex is narcissistic enough that to let June read him the highlights. They're usually either complete fabrications or lines fed, fed from the press team, but sometimes it's just funny. Given the choice, he'd rather read one of the hundreds of glowing pieces of fanfiction about him on the internet, the up to eleven version of himself with devastating charm and unbelievable physical stamina, but June flat out refuses to read those allowed to him, no matter how much he tries to bribe her. <laughs> Do Us Weekly, Alex says. Hmm, June d takes it out of the stack. Oh, look, we made the cover this week. She flashes the glossy cover at him, which, is the, which has a photo of the two of them inlaid in the one corner. June's hair pinned on top of her head, and Alex looking slightly overserved, but still handsome, all jawline and dark curls. Below it, in bold yellow letters, the headline reads, First sibling's wild night. Oh yeah, that was a wild night, Alex says, reclining back against the tall other headboard and pushing his glasses up his nose. Two whole keynote speakers. Nothing sexier than shrimp cocktails and an hour and a half of speeches on carbon emissions. It says here that you had some kind of tryst with a mystery brunette, June reads. Though the first daughter was whisked off by limousine to a star-studded party shortly after the gala, 21-year-old heartthrob Alex was snapped sneaking into the W Hotel to meet a mystery brunette in the presidential suite and, leave, and leaving around 4 a.m. Sources inside the hotel reported hearing amorous noises from the room all night, and rumors are swirling that the brunette was none other than Nora Holleron, the 22-year-old granddaughter of My Vice President Mike Holleron and third member of the White House trio. Could it be the rekindling of their romance? Yes, Alex crows, and June groans. That's less than a month. You owe me fifty dollars, baby. Hold up. Was it Nora? Alex thinks back to the week before, showing up at Nora's room with a bottle of champagne. Their thing on the campaign trail half a million years ago was brief, mostly to get it the inevitable over with. They were seventeen and eighteen and doomed from the start, both convinced they were the smartest person in any room. Alex has since conceded that Nora is 100% smarter than him, and definitely too smart to have ever dated him. It's not his fault the press won't let it go, though. They love the idea of them together as if they're modern-day Kennedys. So if he and Nora occasionally get drunk in a hotel room together watching the West Wing and making loud moaning noises at the wall for the benefit of nosy tabloids, he can't be blamed, really. They're simply turning an undesirable situation into their own personal entertainment. Scamming his sister is also a perk. Maybe, he says, dragging out the vowels. June swats him with the magazine like he's an especially obnoxious cockroach. That's cheating, you dick. <laughs> Bet's a bet, Alex tells her. We said if there was a new rumor in a month, you'd owe me 50 bucks. 
I take Venmo. I'm not paying, June Huffs. I'm going to kill her when we see her tomorrow. What are you wearing, by the way? For what? The wedding. Whose wedding? Um, the royal wedding, June says. Of England. It's literally on every cover I just showed you. She holds us weekly up again, and this time Alex notices the main story in giant letters. Prince Philip says I do! Along with a photograph of an extremely nondescript British heir and his equally nondescript blonde fiancé smiling blandly, he drops his donut in a show of devastation. That's this weekend? Alex, we leave in the morning, June tells him. We've got two appearances before we even go to the ceremony. I can't believe Zara hasn't climbed up your ass about this already. Shit, he groans. I knew I had that written down. I got sidetracked. What, by conspiring with my best friend against me in the tabloids for $50? No, with my research paper, smartass, Alex says, gesturing dramatically at his pile of notes. I've been working on it for Roman political thought all week, and I thought we agreed Nora is our best friend. That can't possibly be a real class you're taking, June says. Is it possibly you willfully forgot about the biggest international event of the year because you don't want to see your arch nemesis? June, I'm the son of the Br President of the United States. Prince Henry is a figurehead of the British Empire. You can't just call him my arch nemesis, Alex says. He returns to his donut, chewing thoughtfully and adds, Arch nemesis applies that he's a implies that he's actually a rival to me on any level, and not, you know, a stuck-up product of inbreeding who probably jerks off to photos of himself. Woof. I'm just saying. Well, you don't have to like him. You just have to put on a happy face and not cause an international incident at his brother's wedding. <laughs> Bug, when do I ever not put on a happy face? Alex says. He pulls a, fake, a painfully fake grin, and June looks satisfyingly repulsed. Ugh. Anyway, you know what you're wearing, right? Yeah, I picked it out and had Zara approve it last month. I'm not an animal. I'm still not sure about my dress, June says. She leans over and steals his laptop away from him, ignoring his noise of protest. Do, the, do you think the maroon or the one with the lace? Lace, obviously. It's England. And why are you trying to make me fail this class? He says, reaching for his laptop, only to have, have his hand swatted away. Go curate your Instagram or something. You're the worst. Shut up. I'm trying to pick something to watch. Ew, you have Garden State on your watch list? Wow, how's film school in 2005 going? I hate you. Mm, I know. Outside the window, the wind stirs up the lawn, rustling the linden trees down in the garden. The record on the turntable has spun out into fuzzy silent. He, rows, he rolls off the bed and flips it, resetting the needle, and the second side picks up on London luck and love. If he's honest, private aviation doesn't really get old, not even three years into his mother's term. He doesn't get to travel this way a lot, but when he does, it's hard not to let it go to his head. He was born in the hill country of Texas as the daughter of a single mother and the son of a Mexican immigrant and the son of Mexican immigrants, all of them poor, all of them dirt poor, luxury travel is still a luxury. Fifteen years ago, when his mother first ran for the house, the Austin newspaper gave her a nickname, the Lomita Longshot. She'd escaped her tiny hometown in the shadow of Fort Hood, pulled night shifts at diners to pull herself through law school, and was arguing discrimination cases before the Supreme Court by 30. She was the last thing anybody expected to rise out of Texas in the middle of the Iraq War. Strawberry blonde, whip-smart Democrat with high heels, an unapologetic draw, and a little biracial family. So it's still surreal that Alex is cruising somewhere over the Atlantic, snagging on pistachios in a high-backed leather chair with his feet up. Nora is bent over the New York Times crossword opposite him, brown curls falling across her forehead. Beside her, the hulking Secret Service agent, Cassius, Cash for short, holds his own copy in, his, in one giant hand, racing to finish it first. The cursor on Alex's Roman political thought paper blinks expectantly at him from his laptop, but something in him just can't quite focus on school while they're flying Atlantic. Amy, his mother's favorite Secret Service agent, a former Navy SEAL who is rumored around D.C. to have killed several men, sits across the aisle. She's got a bulletproof titanium ca case of crafting supplies open on the couch next to her and is serenely embroidering flowers onto a napkin. Alex has seen her stab someone in the kneecap with a very similar embroidery needle. Which leaves June. 
Next to him, leaning on one elbow with her nose buried in the issue of People, she's inexplicably bought, brought with them. She always chooses the most bizarre reading material for flights. Last time, it was a battered old Cantonese phrase book. Before that, death comes for the Archbishop. What are you reading in there now? Alex asks her. She flips the magazine around so we can see the double page spread titled Royal Wedding Madness. Alex groans. This is definitely worse than Willa Cather. <laughs> Unfortunately, there are no pictures in this one. Sorry. <laughs> um, what, she says. I want to be prepared for my first ever royal wedding. You went to the prom, didn't you, Alex says. Just picture that, only in hell. And you have to be really nice about it. Can you believe they spent 75000 just on the cake? That's depressing. And apparently Prince Henry is going sans date to the wedding and everyone is freaking out about it. It says he was, she affects a comical English accent, rumored to be dating a British heiress last month, but now followers of the prince's dating life aren't sure what to think. Alex snorts. It's insane to think of him, it's insane to him to think that there are legions of people who follow the intensely dull dating lives of the royal siblings. He understands why people care where he puts his own tongue. At least he has personality. Maybe the female population of Europe finally realized he's as compelling as a wet ball of yarn, Alex suggests. Nora puts her down her crossword puzzle, having finished it first. Cassius glances over and swears. You can ask him to dance then? Alex rolls his eyes, suddenly imagining twirling around a ballroom while Henry drones sweet nothings about croquet and fox hunting into his ear. The thought makes him want to gag. In his dreams. Aw, Nora says. You're blushing. Listen, Alex tells her, royal weddings are trash. The princes who have royal weddings are trash. The imperialism that allows princes to exist at all is trash. It is trash turtles all the way down. Is this your TED talk? June asks. You do realize America is a genocidal empire too, right? Yes, June, but at least we have the decency not to keep a monarchy around, Alex says, throwing a pistachio at her. There are a few things about Alex and June that new White House hires are briefed on before they start. June's peanut allergies, Alex's frequent middle-of-the-night requests for coffee, June's college boyfriend, who broke up with her when, she moved to, when he moved to California, but is still the only person whose letters come to her directly, Alex's long-standing grudge against the youngest prince. It's not a grudge, really. It's not even a rivalry. It's a prickling, unsettling annoyance. It's, it makes his palms sweat. The tabloids, the world, decide to cast Alex as the American equivalent to Prince Henry from day one, since the White House trio is the closest thing America has to royalty. It has never seemed fair. Alex's image is all charisma and genius and smirking wit, thoughtful interviews and the cover of GQ at 18. Henry's is placid smiles and gentle chivalry and generic charity appearances, a perfectly blank Prince Charming canvas. Henry's role, Alex thinks, is much easier to play. Maybe it is technically a rivalry. Whatever. All right, MIT, he says. What are the numbers on this one? Nora grins. Hmm. She pretends to think hard about it. Risk assessment? F. Sotus failing to check himself before he wrecks himself will result in greater than 500 civilian casualties. 98% probability of Prince Henry looking like a total dreamboat. 78% probability of Alex getting himself banned from the United Kingdom forever. Those are better odds than I expected, June observes. Alex laughs, and the plane soars on. London is an absolute spectacle. Crowds cramming the street at, at outside Buckingham Palace and all through the city, and draped in Union Jacks and waving tiny flags over their heads. There are commemorative royal wedding souvenirs everywhere. Prince Philip and his bride's face plaster on everything from chocolate bars to underwear. Alice almost can't believe this many people care so passionately about something so comprehensively dull. He is sure there won't be this kind of turnout in front of the White House when he or June gets married one day, nor would he even want it. The ceremony itself seems to last forever, but at least it's sort of nice, in a way. It's not that Alex isn't into love or can't appreciate marriage. It's just that Martha is a perfectly respectable daughter of nobility, and Philip is a prince. It's about as sexy as a business transaction. He wants, there's no passion, no drama. Alex's kind of love story is much more Shakespearean. It feels like years before he settled at a table between June and Nora inside a Buckingham Palace ballroom for this reception banquet, 
and he's irritated enough to be a little reckless. Nora passes him a flute of champagne, and he takes it gladly. Do either of you know what a viscount is? June is saying, halfway through a cucumber sandwich. I've met, like, five of them, and I keep smiling politely, as mm, if I know what it means when they say it. Alex, you took comparative international governmental relationships. What? Whatever. What are they? I think it's the thing of when a vampire creates an army of crazed sex waifs and starts his own ruling body, he says. That sounds right, Nora says. She's folding her napkin into a complicated shape on the table, her shiny black manicure glinting in the chandelier light. I wish I were a viscount, June says. I could have my sex waifs deal with my emails. Are sex waifs good with professional correspondence? Alex asks. Nora's napkin has begun to resemble a bird. I think it could be an interesting approach. Their emails would be all tragic and wanton. She tries on a breathless, husky voice. Oh, please, I beg you, take me. Take me to lunch to discuss fabric samples, you beast. Could be weirdly effective, Alex notes. Something is wrong with both of you, June says gently. Alex is, is opening his mouth to retort when a royal attendant materializes at their table but like a dense and dour-looking ghost in a bad hairpiece. Ms. Clermont Diaz, says the man, who looks like his name is probably Reginald or Bartholomew or something. He bows, and miraculously his hairpiece doesn't fall off onto June's plate. Alex shares an incredulous glance with her behind his back. His Royal Highness Prince Henry wonders if you would do him the honor of accompanying him for a dance. June's mouth freezes halfway open, caught in a soft vowel sound, and Nora breaks out into a shit-eating grin. Oh, she'd love to, Nora volunteers. She's been hoping he'd ask all evening. I, June starts and stops, her mouth smiling even as her eyes slice at Nora. Of course, that would be lovely. And there, excellent, says Reginald Bartholomew, and he turns and gestures over his shoulder. And there Henry is, in the flesh, as classically handsome as ever in his tailored three-piece suits, all tousled sandy hair and high cheekbones and a soft, friendly mouth. He holds himself with innately impeccable posture, as if he emerged fully formed and upright out of some beautiful Buckingham Palace posy garden one day. His eyes lock on Alex, and something like annoyance or adrenaline spikes in Alex's chest. He hasn't had a conversation with Henry in probably a year. His face is still infuriatingly symmetrical. Henry deigns to give him a perfunctory nod, as if he's any other random guest, not the person he beat to a Vogue editorial debut in their teens. Alex blinks, seethes, and watches Henry angle his stupid chiseled jaw toward June. Hello, June, Henry says, and he extends a gentlemanly hand to June, who is now blushing. Nora pretends to swoon. Do you know how to waltz? I'm sure I could pick it up, she says, and she takes his hand cautiously, like she thinks he might be pranking her, which Alex thinks is way too generous to Henry's sense of humor. Henry leads her off to the crowd of twirling nobles. So what's happening now? June Alex asks, glaring it down at Nora's napkin bird. Has he decided to finally shut me up by wooing my sister? Ah, uh, little buddy, Nora says. She reaches over and pats his hand. It's cute how you think everything is about you. It should be, honestly. That's the spirit. He glances up into the crowd, where June is being rotated around the floor by Henry. She's got a neutral, polite smile on her face, and he, ke and he keeps looking over her shoulder, which is even more annoying. June is amazing. The least Henry could do is pay attention to her. Do you think he actually likes her, though? Nora shrugs. Who knows? Royals are weird. Might be a courtesy, or... Oh, there it is. A royal photographer has swooped in and snapped a shot of them dancing. One Alex knows will be leaked to hello next week. So that's it then? Using the first daughter to start some idiotic dating rumor for attention? God forbid Philip gets to dominate the news cycle for one week. He's kind of good at this, Nora remarks. Alex flags down the waiter and decides to spend the rest of the reception getting systematically drunk. <laughs> Alex is never told, will never tell, anyone. But he saw Henry for the first time when he was 12 years old. He only ever reflects upon it when he's drunk. He's sure he saw his face in the news before then, but that was the first time he really saw him. June had just turned 15 and used part of her birthday money to buy a, an issue of a blindingly colorful teen magazine. Her love of tabloids started early. In the center of the magazine were miniature posters you could rip out and st stick in your, up in your locker. If you were careful and pried up the staple with your, your fingernails, you could get them out without tearing them. One of them, right in the middle, was the picture of a boy. 
He had thick, tawny hair and big blue eyes, a warm smile, and a cricket back over one shoulder. He must have been a candid because there was a happy, sunbright confidence to him that couldn't be posed. On the bottom corner of the page, in pink and blue letters, Prince Henry. Alex still doesn't know what kept drawing him back, only that he would sneak into June's room and find the page and touch his fingertips to the boy's hair, as if he could somehow feel its texture if he imagined it hard enough. The more his parents climbed the political ranks, the more he started to reckon with the fact that soon the world would know who he was. Then sometimes he'd think of the picture and try to harness Prince Henry's easy confidence. He also thought about prying up the staples with his fingers and taking the picture out and keeping it in his room, but he never did. His fingernails were too stubby. They weren't made for it like June's, like a girl's. But then came the first time he met Henry, the first cool, detached words Henry said to him, and Alex guessed he had it all wrong. The pretty, flung-open boy from the picture wasn't real. The real Henry is a beautiful, distant, boring, and closed. This picture the tabloids keep coming, comparing him to, whom he compares himself to, thinks he's better than Alex and everyone like him. Alex can't believe he ever wanted to be anything like that. Alex keeps drinking, keeps alternating between thinking about it and forcing himself not to think about it, disappears in the crowd and dances with pretty er European heiresses about it. He's pirouetting away from one when he catches sight of a lone figure hovering near the cake and champagne fountain. It's Prince Henry, yet again, glasses in hands, watching Prince Philip and his bride spinning on the ballroom floor. He looks politely half-interested in that obnoxious way of his, like he has somewhere else to be, and Alex can't resist the urge to call his bluff. He picks his way through the crowd, grabbing a glass of wine off a passing tray and drown downing half of it. When you have one of these, Alex says, sidling up to him, you should do two fountain champagne fountains instead of one. Really embarrassing to be at a wedding with only one champagne fountain. Alex, Henry says, in that maddeningly posh accent. Up close, the waistcoat under his suit jacket is a lush gold and has about a million buttons on it. It's horrible. I wondered if I'd have the pleasure. Looks like it's your lucky day, Alex says, smiling. Truly a momentous occasion, Henry agrees. His own smile is bright white and immaculate and made to be printed on money. The most annoying thing of all is Alex knows Henry hates him too. He must. They're naturally mutual antagonists, but he refuses to outright act like it. Alex is intimately aware of politics involves a lot of making nice with people you loathe, but he wishes that once, just once, Henry would act like an actual human and not some polished little wind-up toy sold in a palace gift shop. He's too perfect. Alex wants to poke it. Do you ever get tired, Alex says, of pretending you're above all this? Henry turns and stares at him. I'm sure I don't know what you mean. I mean, you're out here getting the photographers to chase you, swanning around like you hate the attention, and you clearly don't since you're dancing with my sister of all people, Alex says. You act like you're too important to be anywhere, ever. Doesn't that get exhausting? I'm a bit more complicated than that, Henry attempts. Ha! Oh, Henry says, narrowing his eyes. You're drunk. I'm just saying, Alex says, resting an overly friendly elbow on Henry's shoulder, which isn't as easy as he'd like it to be since Henry has about four inches, infuriating inches of height on him. You could try to act like you're having fun, occasionally. Henry laughs ruefully. I believe perhaps you, would cons you should consider switching to water, Alex. Should I, Alex says. He pushes aside the thought that maybe the wine is what gave him the nerve to stomp over to Henry in the first place and makes his eyes as coy and angelic as he knows how. Am I offending you? Sorry I'm not obsessed with you like everyone else. I know that must be confusing for you. Do you know what? Henry says. I think you are. Alex's mouth drops open, while the corner of Henry's mouth turns smug and almost a little mean. Only a thought, Henry says, tone polite. Have you ever noticed that I have never once approached you and have been exhaustively civil every time we've spoken? Yet here you are, seeking me out again. He takes a sip of champagne. Simply an observation. What? I'm not, Alex stammers. You're the... Have a lovely evening, Alex, Henry says tersely and turns to walk off. It drives Alex nuts that Henry thinks he gets to have the last word, and without thinking, he reaches out and pulls Henry's shoulder back. And then Henry turns suddenly and almost does push Hen Alex off from this time, 
and for a brief spark of, of a moment, Alex is impressed at the glint in his eyes, the abrupt burst of an actual personality. The next thing he knows, he's tripping over his own foot and stumbling backward into the table nearest to him. He knows that too late the table is, to his horror, the one bearing the massive eight-tier wedding cake, and he grabs for Henry's arm to catch himself. But all it does is throw both of them off balance and send them crashing together into the cake stand. He watches as if in slow motion as the cake leans, teeters, shudders, and finally tips. There's absolutely nothing he can do to stop it. It comes crashing down on the floor into an avalanche of white buttercream, some kind of sugary $75,000 nightmare. The room goes heart-stoppingly silent as the momentum carries him and Henry through the fall and down, down into the wreckage of the cake on the innate carpet. Henry's sleeve is still clutched in Alex's fist. Al Henry's glass of champagne is spilled over, all over both of them and shattered, and out of the corner of his eyes, Alex can see a cut across the ch top of Henry's cheekbone beginning to bleed. For a second, all he can think of as he stares at the, up at the ceiling while covered in frosting and champagne is that at least Henry's dance with June won't be the biggest story to come out of the royal wedding. His next thought is that his mother is going to murder him in cold blood. Beside him, he hears Henry mutter slowly, Oh my fucking Christ. He registers dimly that it's the first time he's ever heard the prince swear before the flash from someone's camera goes off. And that is the end of chapter one. If you'd like to read more, that is Red, White, and Royal Blue by Casey McKiston. It is, you can find it on our website. It's a big staff favorite. Um, good book. Very fun. Very much a world I wish I lived in. Um, and yeah, I'll see you, we'll see you tomorrow night um, with another story at 845. Hope you're having a lovely evening. And bye.